thanks for finding your way back to this ongoing study of the Greek of the New Testament. If you've been following along, you know that we have completed 14 chapters of Machen's textbook, and we're coming this time to chapter 15. 15, which treats the aorist again, but this is called the second aorist. So in the first uh, treatment of the aorist back in chapter 14, we were learning what's called the first aorist, which is what you might also call the regular aorist. Most verbs that form the aorist in the Greek of the New Testament do so using the first aorist. But there is also an exceptional class of verbs that form the aorist using the second aorist. This is not uncommon. Many languages have something like this, and Machen himself makes the point in the chapter that in English we have a variety of words that form the aorist in the same way. I might want to say that I love somebody, and if I want to put that in the past tense, I would just add the D or the ED at the end, as the case may be. I loved yesterday, I love today, that idea. And of course, in English, many verbs form their uh, aorist by, or their past tense by simply adding ED. But we also have a class of verbs in English that do so irregularly. For example, I might say, I run down the street today, but I wouldn't say, I runned down the street yesterday, unless I wanted to get some very strange responses from people. I would use, rather, the English word ran. And ran, as you know, is a past tense, but it's irregular in the sense that we form the past tense in a way other than simply adding ed to the word. Uh, Machen uses the example of rose. I rise today, I rose yesterday. I don't say I rised yesterday. That again wouldn't be good English. So this is not an uncommon or unexpected sort of thing. And when we find it in the Greek language, we should simply accept that as a matter of course, is the way that many languages will uh, form the past tense in more than one fashion. Well, in the case of the second aorist, what we need to note is that the change, the signal, as it were, that we know that the aorist is being used is a change not in the ending so much as in the stem. And so if I'm going to use the aorist of a certain Greek word, then if it's a second aorist word, then I'll change the stem itself. Maybe an example might be the word lambano. You know, we learned that in the very first uh, vocabulary list, lambano, I take or I receive. Well, the change in the stem here would be to take the word lamban, which is the stem in the present, and change it to the aorist stem, which is simply lambda, alpha, beta, and we would be pronounced lob. I augment that, a lob, and then I put on the second aorist ending, which actually is identical to the imperfect endings. And so, while that may seem a little surprising, actually it helps a bit because you don't have to learn a new set of endings here. You can just simply co-opt the memory work you've already done and incorporate it here. So, if I want to form the past tense of lambano, I take, I would say a laban, I took. And that would be the aorist of it. And then I simply use the same imperfect endings that I've learned before. A la bon, a la bes, a la be, a la bomen, a la beta, a la bon. And so the very same endings are going to do double service here, and I'm going to use them in the second aorist as well. There are some second aorist stems that really uh, will seem surprisingly unlike the original root. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm just not smart enough to figure out how they got from blepo to adon, but that's the second aorist stem. Actually, there is an explanation for that, and it comes from another Greek word, horao, which also means to see. But even there, it's not altogether obvious how that second aorist stem was developed. Well, that's just the way it is. Sorry I can't be a little bit more helpful there, but uh, the only way to really master this is just to put in the elbow grease necessary to memorize this information. And for each verb, you want to learn not only the verb in the present tense, but you want to learn the other principal parts of it. And so far, of course, we have the present, the future. And right now we're dealing with the aorist, the third of the principal parts. And all you need to keep in mind is that the aorist will sometimes form its aorist uh, in the uh, first aorist form or the second aorist form. And generally speaking, for any, gun, any given verb, it's going to be one or the other. Now, Something Machen points out in the extended footnote on the first page of this chapter is something I'll just notice with you here, although we won't worry about it too much yet. 
but uh, Machen is sort of overstating the case a little bit. Many words that are second aorist in their, by changing the stem, nevertheless continue to use a first, in, uh, first aorist ending. That may seem a little confusing. I'm just saying they'll sometimes use the first aorist ending rather than the second aorist ending, uh, endings, which are you know the um, uh, imperfect endings. Uh, and for now, don't worry about that. It's something to keep in mind, and certainly when we come to the New Testament itself, we'll have to deal with that and we'll notice it. But uh, for now, just to keep things simple, we're going to assume that verbs are either first aorist or second aorist in the way that they form the past tense and we'll learn it that way, and that'll actually make it easier at a later time when we notice there are still further exceptions to the rule than the exception that we've already encountered in dealing simply with the second aorist itself. I hope that wasn't too confusing. At this point, I just want you to focus on verbs having a first or second aorist and learn the endings that are associated with each one, and we should do fine. Again, I want to take the approach that we have in past lessons. We're going to look at the vocabulary list. You'll notice in the vocabulary that many of the words we encounter here are words we've already learned, but now we're simply learning the distinctive form that they take in the second aorist. We'll go through three exercises of the translation, three exercises of the composition, and then once again I'll leave it to you to go ahead and round out the rest of the exercises, and uh, if you master all that and feel like you're in good shape, then we'll be in a position to move on to chapter 16. So, with that, let's, uh, let's take a look at these vocabulary words. The first of our vocabulary words is the word gar, gamma, alpha, rho, gar. It is post-positive, which, as you know, means that it will never come first in a phrase. It's the word that's commonly translated in the New Testament by the word for. And I might just mention that the word gar is probably used more frequently in Greek than the word for, F-O-R, would be used in English. But it's the reason that many biblical texts that you are familiar with begin with the word for. You think about John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Well. The word gar is being used there, and if you think about it, you know that many verses in the New Testament use that for language, and it's not really showing a strong logical connection necessarily, but more kind of a soft logical connection or inference from that which has previously been stated. So it's a very common word. I think you can sometimes leave it untranslated, depending on the way in which you want to uh, think about the rest of the phrase, but that's the first of our vocabulary words. We'll be seeing this quite frequently from this point on. The next word we have is this word balo, uh, abalon. Balo, you, we've already had, it means to throw, as in throwing a ball. When we form the aorist, it's second aorist. Notice that the change in the stem in this case is fairly simple. Rather than a double lambda, balo, we simply have a single lambda, and that's all there is to it. That's the change. So the second aorist is ebalon, ebalon, and it means I threw, as in I threw a ball yesterday. We, here we have the word uh, egenomain. We've had genomai, I become. We've had the future of it, genosomai, I will become. And here we have the aorist, which notice once again is a second aorist, because we have the gen, which is the second aorist stem. The augment is here. Notice that the ending is not the first aorist ending. It has an omicron, which is actually what we found when we were dealing with the imperfect. So it's agonomain or agonomain, which means I became. So it's similar to the words we've had before related to this verb genomai, and that should be fairly easy to remember. Adon, I mentioned this earlier, this is actually the aorist, the second aorist of the word blepo. And once again, I'm not quite sure how the shift was made from blepo to adon, but there it is. And it's very common in the New Testament, so this is a word you definitely want to become familiar with. I'll just note that in the New Testament itself, you'll find that the ending is very often the first aorist ending. So instead of Omicron nu, it would be Alpha nu, and that's just uh, very commonly the case. And so just keep your mind on that. 
as we find it uh, taking place in the New Testament. But that means I saw uh, the aorist of blepo. Apon, similarly, somewhat unexpected, is the aorist of lego. I say, apon, I said. Here we have the word that I was mentioning in the opening discussion, elaban. It's from lambano. Again, you'll see that the original stem has been contracted some fr somewhat from lamban to simply lab, elaban, I took or I received. So we've already talked about that a little bit. This is the word egagon, which is from the word ago. You recall ago, I lead. This would be the uh, aorist of this, the future. You recall was augzo, I will lead. Here we augment the alpha so it becomes eta. There is a rough similarity between this word and the word ago, but it is nevertheless somewhat irregular and hence it becomes a second aorist with the normal second aorist uh, ending there. So egagon, I led. Alphone, once again, this is not exactly predictable. This is from the verb erkamai, I come or I go. Very common in the New Testament. Alphon, I came or I went. And the uh, word is uh, one that you'll want to master. Again, you'll sometimes find it in the New Testament with first aorist endings. And so just be aware that this will come in both forms. Anegka, once again, quite irregular in terms of the way that the stem is being formed. This is from Pharaoh, I bear, or I bring. So anegka is I brought. But please notice here the alpha tells us that the endings are not going to be second aorist, but first aorist. It's going to be anegka, anegkas, anegke, anegkamen. It's irregular because we don't have the sigma, which is typically present in the first aorist, but nevertheless the endings themselves are first aorist endings. Here's the word lepo, <clears throat> I leave, and the second aorist form of it is elipon, I left. And so it's uh, the end of the stem here is fairly similar. We just dropped out the epsilon, so it became lip. Elipon, I left. And the last of our vocabulary words, the uh, next one here is opsomai. Opsomai, this is the future of blepo. Blepo, again, um, uh, I see. You wouldn't exactly predict that opsomai would become the future, although you'll notice there's a separate Greek verb that doesn't show up much in the New Testament, which is the root of this. It is the word from which we get the word optometry, so that may help you, op opsomai. This is deponent, future, and so opsomai, I shall or I will see. And of course it forms the other uh, forms of the conjugation just by adding the variety of endings that are appropriate there. Pipto, I fall has a second aorist, epeson, I fell. And aside from that, it's pretty much what we would uh, otherwise expect. And finally, prospero, I bring to. This, of course, you'll notice is a combination of pros and fero, I bring to. It's pretty predictable that it would mean something like that. If you use that verb, so I bring, let's say, a man to the Lord, then the man in that sentence would be in the accusative case, the direct object of the action, and the Lord would be in the dative case, the indirect object of that action. Turning our attention now briefly simply to the conjugation, of course at this point Machen doesn't use Luo because Luo takes the first aorist, so he finds a comparable second aorist verb to illustrate his point. So we're going to use the word uh, lepo, which in the second aorist is elepon, elepon, elipes, elipen, elipomen, elipita, elupon. So here you'll see these endings are exactly the same endings that we learned when we were doing the imperfect. So that is kind of nice. We have the second aorist stem and the imperfect ending, and taken together that gives us the second aorist. In the 
Second aorist middle, again, these are the same endings we learned in the imperfect middle. So it's elipomain, elipu, elipeto, elipometha, elipestha, eliponto. So once again, no big surprises there. And that should be fairly easy to master given that you've already learned those endings. With that, let's uh, go ahead and take a look at the exercises and then I'll turn you loose to go through the rest of them. And we'll uh, meet back again in our 16th uh, chapter, but uh, let's look at the exercises first. So the first of the exercises that Machen gives us, we have right here, kai edomen ton curion, kai ekusamen tus lagus autu. So we start right off the word kai seems a little bit unexpected because usually sentences don't begin with the word uh, and, but then I immediately notice I have another one here and so I kind of assume maybe this is going to be a both and situation because a chi used in parallel with another one will often mean that. So let's hold that in abeyance for a moment. Adomen, of course I now know that adon is the aorist of the word blepo, so this is the first person plural ending on the second aorist stem and it's going to be we saw ton curion, the Lord, and I'm going to assume that this is both, so we both saw the Lord, Kai, and Akusa men. Here's a first aorist from the word akuo, and we heard tus, the lagus, accusative case, the words of him or his words. So we both saw the Lord and heard his words. The second exercise, Ude gar eselthis ace tus oikus auton, Ude apis autois parable lane. Now, once again, I notice that I have a Uda and I also have an Uda, and when I see those two in parallel in the same sentence, I can assume until proven wrong that uh, this is going to be a neither this nor that situation, neither nor kind of arrangement. It can also mean not even, of course, but in this case I think we're going to go with the former possibility. Gar, you recall, post-positive is always going to come second, at least second in the phrase. Now here we have ace aelthes. I, of course, recognize that aelthone is the aorist of erkamai. This is going to be the second person singular ending, and ace at the beginning means some, something like to enter, to go in, or come in. And so taken together, it's going to be for you, uh, neither entered into tois oikus auton, into their houses, nor, so neither nor, nor said, same ending here, second person singular, nor said autois to them, parable lane, a parable. For you neither entered into their houses, nor said to them a parable. And our third exercise, in a kene tehora, agenoto, mathetai, tu, kiriu. In, I know takes the dative, demonstrative pronoun in the dative, in that, with the feminine ending going with te hora, in that hour, agenonto, this is the third person plural from genomai, second aorist, they became, mathetai, takes the predicate nominative, they became disciples to kiriu. They became disciples of the Lord. In that hour, they became disciples of the Lord. All right, well, that was pretty straightforward, wasn't it? Let's uh, shift our focus to the uh, composition exercises. In this case, we're going from English to Greek. And so if we read the first of the English exercises here, let's take a look at it. This is number one. We did not see him for we were not yet disciples of him. We did not see him. And of course, uh, ouk, the negation, ouk, edomen, second aorist. This is the first person plural ending on the second aorist stem. We 
did not see, auton takes the accusative, auton him, uh, upo, not yet, as you know, and so it's an adverb, always comes in that form, for, postpositive, for, not yet, amen, from a me, this is the imperfect, so it's the first person plural, uh, we were, for, not yet, we were, mathetai, a me, uh, a me, or amen here, takes the predicate nominative, and so we were not yet disciples out to of him. We uh, did not yet see him, for we were not yet disciples of him, or his disciples. The second of our exercises, the apostle brought the sinners to him. Pretty straightforward. We start off with the apostle, ho apostolos, the apostle. Here is the word prospero, I bring to. We know it's going to be in the uh, aorist, uh, so the aorist of Pharaoh is enegka, but remember it takes first aorist endings. So here we're going to have enegka. The pros, pros enegka, therefore, is derived from prospero. You'll recall we mentioned that it takes the accusative of the thing brought and the dative of the thing to whom it is brought. So the apostles brought then tus hamartalus, the sinners, in the accusative case, auto, in the dative case, to him. The apostle brought the sinners to him. All right, and finally, the third of our exercises we have from Machen reads, you, plural, ye, did not hear me, but ye came to my disciples. So we're using the second person plural, which Machen uses the word, the old English word, ye, to accomplish that. Sometimes when I teach Greek, I tell kids to say y'all, like they say in the South, you know. But either way, just so you know that we're dealing here with the uh, plural, the second person plural. Here it is, uh, ouk, not, ekousata, first aorist, second person plural ending, ekousata. You, plural, did not hear. Here we have me, which is the personal pronoun. It's enclitic, and you recall the rule of enclitic accent is when you have an acute on the antepenult, then you put another acute on the ultima in order to carry it through to the me. So you did not hear me, but we'll contract it here because it's preceding a word that begins with a vowel. But you came, again, this is a second aorist, so it has the second aorist stem with what would otherwise be the imperfect ending. But you came, pros, takes the accusative, to, tus, the mathetas, disciples of me. And once again, we have mu, which is enclitic, so we don't change that acute accent to a grave. So it's going to be to the disciples of me. And so once again, I think you'll see that that's uh, fairly straightforward. And hopefully that makes sense the way that we've done those. And we'll leave our treatment of the exercises right there for the time being. So this chapter 15 is quite important. It gives us the second aorist. And as you can probably guess, the second aorist, though it's not as common as the first aorist in the New Testament, is nevertheless very common and certainly one that you'll want to master. So go ahead and work your way through the exercises that are at the end of this chapter. I've given you once again the answer key, and as I've instructed you many times, as you work through, I would take a look at the answer immediately after you've done the exercises and try to figure out exactly where any errors may occur. And once you feel like you're very comfortable with those and, and are ready to move on, then we'll come back and meet again as we take a look at chapter 16. So until then, God richly bless your uh, continuing studies of the Greek language, and we'll see you next time.